it's not normal to be throwing up through anxiety because you're worried about the work that you have to do. And through people like us openly sharing our experiences, it's going to make other people feel more comfortable and confident to speak up and talk about their experiences or challenge things within their organizations or speak up to sort of leaders um, and the like. And I'm not saying everyone needs to just go and quit their job if they're unhappy, <laughs> um, because that would be ignorant to the fact that people can't just quit their jobs. Um, but I think if nothing else, if we can encourage people to speak up and challenge um, things that don't sit right with them. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing in organizations, particularly with Gen Z. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of that. And I think we're going to start seeing more organizational leaders listen and start implementing changes that benefit um, sort of the well being around sort of millennials, Gen Zs, um, and more sort of employers more broadly. Welcome back to Secrets of a Corporate Game. So many people are trying to navigate a corporate world that is laden with secrets, cleverly hidden and unspoken roles to a game that most employees don't even know they're playing. On this podcast, we try to give you a peek behind the curtain and unveil some of those secrets with tips and tricks that you can apply today to start taking control of your career and progress up the ladder faster. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back. I am so jazzed about today's episode. So uh, not only do we have a fabulous guest for you, but it's somebody who I have been following for a long time. It's definitely inspired part of my journey. And we're going to be talking about being a millennial in the corporate workplace and then some toxic corporate business practices as well. We're here with Henry. He is that corporate lawyer. Uh, he's a qualified lawyer from the UK, also a newfound influencer since 20, promoting the importance of mental health in the workplace and challenging some of those corporate toxic behaviors we talk about often on my channel. And then on social media, he creates relatable, very relatable, very relatable and impactful content for positivity and touches everybody with his content. So great, Henry. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to, to chat all things millennial life, corporate millennial life even. I know. I feel like it's a, it's a unique niche in the corporate space, how millennials are approaching the workplace and some of the situations we find ourselves in. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your background, both professionally and then in the influencer space as well? Yeah, sure. So hi, I'm Henry. Uh, I am a qualified lawyer. Uh, as you kindly mentioned, I am now five years qualified, uh, which makes me feel really old. And I've been practicing since 2018 is when I qualified and I was in private practice uh, for a number of years up until 2021 when I quit my job and then I went in-house as an in-house lawyer and during that time is when I probably summer 2021 I'd just been there for about eight nine months I started making content on TikTok and I don't know how kind of yours took off your socials but my first video first to second like did quite well I was like oh that was funny uh let's do another <laughs> one and then another one and it was just really like i'd never used TikTok before downloading it um i was like an old man watching like content on reels um over on instagram and yeah i, I just i liked it and i didn't think anyone was really like knew that i did it and suddenly my like followers started growing brands started reaching out i thought oh wow um and i'm a middle child so suddenly getting some attention i was like oh this is cool <laughs> um and then I was doing that alongside working my nine to five, Monday to Friday, uh, which is never truly a nine to five. You're always doing like eight till six or whatever. And it effectively became like I was running two full-time jobs um, and it was sort of impacting my life outside of working because I'd be working Monday to Friday and then I'd have to shoot content on the weekends or the evenings in the summer when it was light out and brand deals, the sort of, they're quite pressured in terms of we need this done by then I'm like oh, I'm actually working a normal job then um, so it all became quite overwhelming and I think I was borderline touching uh, burnout so then I decided to quit my job and I just enjoyed the social media stuff so much I wanted to keep doing it um, and then I became a consultant lawyer at the big law firm that I'm at now so I just work Tuesday Wednesdays and Thursdays as a lawyer which is which is nice it's a nice balance that you've been able to, to carve for yourself. I know it can be challenging, especially when the corporate world has so much stability and allure, but then the social media is kind of the fun outlet as well. Absolutely. Um, and I think 
some of my favorite things that have come from having, I don't even know what to call it, like a social media presence um, has been like the incredible people that I have got to meet. Like opportunities like this, we would have never crossed paths um, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for us both putting us, ourselves out on social media. Um, being able to do like a TED talk on men's mental health, that's something I'm super passionate about and being able to do that um, was a real privilege. So um, there are so many fun things like all the PR events and like the influencer parties and all of that. That's that's crazy. And I still feel a bit like a like I don't belong, like the imposter syndrome that you get in the corporate world <laughs> still transfers over to like influencer world. Um, I was at Coachella the other weekend and I don't know if you were there, uh, but I felt so out of place at one of the influencer parties we were invited to. Um, but again, it was still so much fun and I was super grateful to be there. That's awesome. Yeah, we were talking before we started recording that, you know, sometimes Henry will have people come up to him and, hey, I follow you on social media and it's happened to me sometimes to some of you guys as well. And it's such a surreal experience because as amazing as it is to be on social media and get to produce this content and get to have these experiences, make these connections, we're just like, we're just normal people trying to live life, you know? And it's, it's such a crazy thing that has come out of like the social media boom for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is going to sound like a really douchey thing when I say it, but my friend <laughs> and me, when we were in LA, we were literally doing the Hollywood Hills, like hike up to the sign classic. And we got stopped. I was like, we're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's like a Wednesday afternoon, like who's out here? And this kid and his girlfriend, like they were lovely, um, just stopped me and they're like, I follow you on social media. I thought, I'm, I don't even live in this country. And I was like a pasty white Brit, obviously just walking out <laughs> and stood out like a sore thumb. Um, but as you mentioned, that's so surreal um, that that happens in the sort of joy that people get or the company. <laughs> Uh, content. I think your dog wants to, maybe your dog recognizes me from socials. That's why he's barking. He's like, I'm interested. I want to be yeah. a guest host. <laughs> please yeah. ignore. Yep. And I, I just, I just yeah. think that it's such a cool thing, but I don't think I would ever give up being a lawyer like altogether because I like using that side of my brain. And also I think, as you mentioned, like the stability of having like a traditional job, um, is definitely quite comforting. Although, I mean, if you look at all the layoffs and stuff happening, I guess there's still uncertainty even with um, like traditional corporate jobs. Huge thank you to today's sponsor for our episode, Symposia Academia. They assist individuals to get into cybersecurity and you do not need a degree or any prior work experience. They'll help you land a GRC analyst position in cybersecurity with their four-step process, which includes training and internship, interview preparation, and then on-the-job support. In order to get started, go ahead and head over to the link www.symposia.com slash channel dash partner slash kb dash three you can also find this link down in the show notes but again it is symposia.com slash channel dash partner slash kb dash three and check them out yeah no i totally agree and i think we've seen a lot of layoffs lately um especially in the u.s i have a lot of clients in the the uk and in germany and i think it's it's definitely a rougher time in the job market right now but you know you bring a unique perspective i think to how corporate works. And I'd love to hear how you think the content that you're sharing is kind of influencing the corporate environment, because I think there is, you do have a big platform, you have a lot of influence over the individual. Like, do you see that translating into how workplaces are operating or some of like those corporate toxic behaviors? Are you hoping to make changes with those? Yeah. I mean, as much as my ego would love it, I don't think I'm single-handedly going to change the profession. But I think with creators like you and me and so many other creators in this sort of um, corporate space, I think it's going to be hard for organizations to um, not listen to the noise that's being made. And even if you flip it to those looking to enter um, various organizations, if they're seeing creators talk in a certain way about certain industries and platforms, graduates and new entrants to these professions are going to be more wary. We're already seeing that with Gen Z. Gen Z are a lot less tolerant um, about a number of certain things, prioritizing sort of work-life 
um, balance sort of environmental concerns, well-being. And I think that's so encouraging to see. Uh, but I kind of view our content across the corporate space as almost like glass door reviews, um, but that are more engaging um, and sort of relatable and people just see them more regularly, which, I mean, I did a campaign with Deloitte a couple of months ago, and that was focused around their Gen Z and millennial workplace well-being study. So it's clear that organizations like Deloitte, big organizations, do see the impact that social media creators have in terms of um, messages that they can convey, which I just think it's really good to see these organizations use platforms like this. Yeah. What you're sharing is is resonating so much with me, Henry, because I think, you know, I look at, at Gen Z as a great example. I see so much content that's like Gen X versus millennial versus Gen Z, like on a phone call and Gen X is like, oh, I'm working so hard. And millennials are like, oh my gosh, somebody's calling me. Okay, I got to I got to work. And Gen Zs are like, nope, thanks so much. It's after hours, right? But I think it's good this conversation that's taking place between more boundary setting that I think Gen Z, it comes a little more naturally to them. Millennials, like we've seen some stuff in our time on this planet, right? We're a little more willing to put up with some stuff for a steady paycheck, some consistency. And then I think Gen X, you know, they kind of fall in between us and like that baby boomer generation that is that more like work the long hours, just kind of suffer through mentality. And so I do think there's there's a change in the narrative with how the corporate world is operating. But I'd love to hear from you, like what are some of those things that you think millennials are facing and the Gen Z is facing as they come into the workplace that like maybe companies should take a closer look at and then should pay a little more attention to? Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you mentioned the generation comparison videos because one of my absolute best creative friends, Cruz, does like so many um, of them. And I, I love watching them because I don't know about you, but as much as I aspire to be like a Gen Z and eventually like a Gen Alpha as they come up, the millennial in me finds it so hard to say no <laughs> to things or to decline a meeting. Like I couldn't, I couldn't possibly. Um, but yeah. I, I love that for, for Gen Z. But yeah, in terms of kind of not struggles, but things that I think are going to impact Gen Z and sort of millennial in the workplace, uh, we touched on it earlier, but I think the point around job security um, I think that's going to impact um, these generations a lot more um, in terms of we are seeing mass layoffs and redundancies within particular industries, which is perhaps why we're seeing more of a aspiration amongst sort of younger millennials and Gen Zs to kind of work for themselves or be part of like startups um, or sort of have side gigs, become content creators and, and that sort of stuff. I think that coupled with kind of the rising cost of living in all sort of major cities across the globe is going to have an astronomical impact on those generations as well in terms of being able to save appropriately to even be able to buy property. I think that's becoming further and further sort of out of reach um, for a lot of people, which of course, not everybody, I think people are buying houses later because people want to go off and travel more and sort of prioritize other things. But I think people would still like to have it as an aspiration. But I don't think current sort of economic climates allow for that, um, which I think then adds just to sort of the mental health strain that a lot of these generations, millennials, Gen Zs um, are going through in terms of the sort of the corporate environments, the pressures of sort of just society as it is. Um, I think that's going to negatively impact a lot of people. And the point around sort of you mentioned around baby boomers and kind of elder generations, it's then hard for Gen Z and millennials to say to their baby boomer bosses, I'm feeling burnt out. I'm struggling because then they just get dismissed with you're lazy. Back in my day, we didn't have mental health days. Um, what is a mental health day? You just you you just don't want to work. You just want to watch Netflix. I just think grow up okay and i think yeah. times have changed um and i think as soon as we start acknowledging these struggles that these juniors within the industries are facing and we create sort of environments that enable their best performance we're going to see those people flourish those people will want to stay at those organizations those people will want to progress up the ranks but i think there has to be a fundamental shift in attitudes 
in these organizations and that primarily starts from the top down because we're all shouting upwards heck we're making videos on the internet about it that's how passionate <laughs> we are but they need to be listening and the decision makers need to be implementing uh these changes yeah it's funny there's so many things you touched on that we could talk about and there's like there's three three things i want to touch on so the first is you talked about the cost of living. My background is in economics and econometrics, and I'm like very passionate about what's happening in the world right now. And I saw a TikTok, of course, because this is where I get all of my information at this stage of my life. And it said that if you made, this is US dollars, but like 80,000 in 85, it's the equivalent of making almost 300,000 today. Like that, when you calculate the cost of living mm. and the value of inflation and the cost of property, that it's, like more than triple what it cost. Yeah. And so I, to your point, other generations were like, well, just, you know, uh, use the Dave Ramsey, like just don't drink Starbucks and you can buy a house in a year. And I'm like, dude, I could not drink Starbucks ever again and never buy a house. Let's all like be real. What's happening in our economic climate. And the, the second thing that I wanted to touch on that you mentioned is uh, I have a, a passion for what I consider to be like mental load. So in a relationship, mental load would be that, you know, the wife says, do the dishes. And then she says, hey, did you do the dishes? And then she makes sure the dishes get done. At that point, she's carrying all the mental load and her partner is doing the task, but not carrying the mental load. And the wife gets burnt out, right? It's kind of the the relationship equivalent because they're having to carry out mental components of the task, even if they're not physically completing it. In the U.S. that was talking about how the average employee is carrying like more than double the mental load of their boomer counterpart at the same level in their career because things are moving so much faster. There's so much more technology. Things change so rapidly that the amount we have to think about is why burnout is increasing so much is the expectations haven't changed. The time investment's actually gone up. And then you're having to think about all the different things and all the different places all the time and people burn out. And I agree with you. I think companies are going to have to they're going to have to change the way that they're operating if they want to retain great talent, if they want to be able to keep those people engaged, for sure. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And on, on that, that's a really interesting point you raised around the, the, the mental load carrying, because I think as much as I love like hybrid working, working from home, flexible working, I think it adds so many benefits to so many people. But there then comes the risk of being constantly available and then you're kind of carrying i don't know if it's the same because i don't, haven't really looked into that concept but i would assume me personally i'm then carrying this sort of weight that oh I sh it's like 7 p.m i'm making dinner i'll just check my work phone just to see what i'm coming into tomorrow and then i start worrying about it all night or i think i've forgotten something whereas when we had like literal desktops in the office that you had to go in and you would leave at the end of the day there was no way of me checking or being contactable in any capacity um, mm -hmm. unless someone had a personal number. So there's that added pressure. And also there's so much content out there that's like hustle, grind. You need to be like seven streams of income. You need to be investing this. Otherwise, you're going to like die poor and you're not going to have enough for retirement. And I think all of these pressures, you need to look a certain way. You need to be dating these people. You need to be seen at these lunch spots, dinner spots. There is so much pressure for us to all be living this certain life. And as great as social media has been in terms of like the doors it's opened for us, there are still its downfalls, like those pressures that come alongside of it. Like I posted something on LinkedIn about this today that I'm guilty of looking at like other people's lives and like and then I feel bad because I'm like, why am I not doing that? Or why don't I look like that? Or maybe if I just go and buy this, I'll suddenly feel like that person looks in their picture. Um, and I think if I'm experiencing that, then um, I'm sure that a lot of my cohort are also feeling the same and Gen Z are probably feeling the same. And heck, Gen my six year old niece, um, I got her her first iPad for Christmas just gone um, and like we limited it. So she couldn't really like go on much. It's just like super kid friendly. Um, but she's watching these shows on like YouTube kids and they're all on their phones. They're all um, like dressing me as like an old man it's like barbie looks a bit provocative in this like netflix <laughs> show um and it was they use um ipads at their school for like education and stuff i just think go outside and play 
um, mm -hmm. because I know how toxic the internet can be and I'll get a hate comment and that will sit with me for a long time and like this innocent child is going to grow up through all of this um, like I hope she never has to but inevitably there are always going to be negative comments on the internet and I just think the resilience that comes that you need to have um, not just on the internet but in your career and in your sort of profession it's it's so sort of demanding and like us as millennials we've been through all sorts um, over the last couple of years <laughs> and <laughs> if we want to get a four or five dollar pound coffee from Starbucks um, or other coffee shop whatever it may be let us Okay, it's the least. <laughs> if that's the worst thing we're doing, we're yeah, doing fine. Honestly, honestly, we're not doing too much health bad for the most part. <laughs> we just want to be yeah. happy. Right? And my $7 caramel macchiato helps, okay? No, but I. I <laughs> yeah. What you're touching on with like the dangers of social media, because this is something. I've gone back and forth with a lot as a social media creator as I was recently talking to some other friends in the space like you should you know share more of your personal life your personal life so interesting you do all these things like wouldn't that be cool for your followers and I'm like very strict that I don't post about my personal life mm. because I want to enjoy it and I don't want to get into the habit of like I have to record this because it's got to be content and then I do post it and then I'm looking at everybody else's content. I'm like, oh, my content doesn't look as good as their content. Like I need to get, I need to be recording my breakfast in a more aesthetically pleasing way or whatever it is right now. Yeah, this yeah. doesn't mean I, like, like every millennial since we're on the topic, take pictures of my snacks when I go out to eat. I don't know why yeah, we all do that. But yeah. like, what mass brainwashing did we all undergo that we're like, oh, this sandwich is pretty. Take a photo that I'll never post or use, but I just have on my phone. I don't know. But I do think that like, it, it can be challenging because um, I was actually having this conversation with my husband yesterday. I have a seven-year-old daughter, uh, very similar experience. She wants a YouTube channel so bad. And I'm like, please, yeah. for the love of all that is holy, do not start a YouTube channel. Um, yeah. And I was talking to my husband yesterday. I'm like, man, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm not being a very good mom lately. Like I've been working so hard. I haven't been playing as much. I haven't been as involved. And my husband was like, stop getting on Instagram. He's like, you're watching these moms whose full-time job is doing cute stuff with their kids and putting it on social media. And it's like warping your brain of what a yeah. well, mom is like. And I was like, that's such a good reminder because you do, you get sucked in to this black hole of like, I need to live like them. I want to look like them. I want to do like them. I want to go like them. And instead we're all just doing the best we can. We survived 2020. That was <laughs> <We're> a year. Like <laughs> It was a year, y'all. Like, and and I'm very thankful for it in some ways because it did put me onto social media and it did change my life and it allowed me to work from home and so many great things. But I think it is really important the mental health aspect of what you're bringing up with social media because I think it filters into our corporate lives and to our seven side hustles and to everything that we're trying to do every day. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And just on the point around sort of the private stuff you mentioned, posting on. Um, or more sort of personal stuff on social media. Like I ha still have like a private Instagram that I had before I ever made like my the corporate lawyer one. Um, I have like 100, 200 followers, which like school friends, family and stuff. Um, and very soon on from like making content publicly, uh, I made a very active decision that if I'm with content creator friends, we can share that. But if it's like my family or my nieces or um, like my ex-girlfriend wanted to be posted more on my like business page. But I thought that, no, I don't want people then like that's not what Wait. this account is. Um, people might just message you inappropriate things. And I just like some of the DMs I get and I'm sure you get like hella creepy DMs as well. Like that's not it what happens. this is. This is a, like a community of sort of where we're all going through similar experiences around like millennial like working life like I'm trying to be a bit more like social on social media which is a funny thing but I still wouldn't share like other people that necessarily aren't in this field because like I chose to put myself on here these other people haven't and like people comment on how I look all the time and for the most part I can like brush it off like some things like hit hard you're like especially if I'm in like a low mental health like mood because I've had like a rubbish day at work or something you see one comment and you just think, cool, that hurt. Um, <laughs> I'll be thinking about that for the next six weeks on and off. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, but again, I think it's, it's about finding the balance and kind of what works for you. And I always try and keep in my head that because I know I put content on social media and we have to do things in a certain way for like engagement and likes, um, and you know that I'm playing a character um, for a lot of things, that a lot of what you see on social media isn't real. You see this super shredded dude, I'm like, why don't I look like that? I'm like, probably he's been like, his nutrition is probably like quite strict, lighting, tan, all of that stuff. Um, like mm -hmm. we know how to take good photos and make ourselves look like a certain way, but also when you're just scrolling and you're like in the pits a bit, you're like, oh, actually, uh, it's easy to kind of get caught up. Yeah, I I totally agree. And I think it's so interesting because, you know, on the corporate side, I still have a corporate job. You still have a corporate job in addition to our now side hustles that are pretty successful. I also think like I don't want people I work with to like see my family. I'd be curious your take on this because, you know, I post pretty polarizing content. My, my yeah. platform is very polarizing. It's kind of, I think you're more... Uh, of that like persona space, a little more palatable. Um, and I was so worried. My CIO was like, I'm going to start following you. And I was like, oh, please don't. That's not necessary. You don't have to do that. Thank you so much for your support. Um, so I'm curious what your take is on, especially knowing that like people you work with or clients you work for will be seeing your social media as well. If that changes how you post. I'm more conscious because I know my law firm follows me. I know a lot of other law firms follow me and our like regulatory professional body for lawyers here in the UK also follows me. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily like I'm not going to post like wild nights out on social media. One, because I don't really go on wild nights out. And two, like that's why I have a private Instagram that um, it's for that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I am more mindful now. The the role that I have at the moment, uh, interestingly, when I was being interviewed for it, the very last question that my now supervisor had for me was like, "You the guy on TikTok?" <laughs> I just yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't lie. Because <laughs> imagine that starting a new job and they're like, "He's a liar." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Good start. But it it was it was kind of nice knowing that it was dealt with like at the outset so I didn't get like exposed or like found or someone comes up to me like oh we found his TikTok and that had to be like a whole um process then um and to be honest if they weren't happy with it I probably wouldn't have accepted that role because of the positive impact social media has had on my corporate sort of it, it I don't know if you found the same you probably have but um it's changed the whole trajectory of my career in terms of like the stuff that I get to do. I get to openly talk um, at events around sort of workplace wellbeing, changes in the workplace, uh, sort of men's mental health, all of these things that I'm super passionate about. And before I would be just talking about it and they're like, shut this boy up, like no one cares, no one's listening. Um, and now people are listening and to have a like somewhat of a platform where I can actually use um, that platform to like advocate for good um, I'm going to keep doing that until like all of my followers drop to zero. Um, like mm -hmm. until that point, um, why wouldn't I? Um, it's, it's what I like doing and I've got an opportunity to actually try and be a part of a real change. Um, and that's what, um, uh, I'm going to try and do. Yeah. I love that. Cause it's, it's similar for me. I used to uh, have a lot of mentees before I was doing a lot of mentee people I was helping. And I remember I would have bosses like, oh, that's cute. It's a nice side to desk thing. Just like, don't let it get in the way of your job. Please mm -hmm. make sure it's not distracting from your work. And now I have executives who come to me who are like, hey, can you talk about that mentorship thing to like the whole company? Can you do like a presentation? And it's such a different interaction. Yeah. So I totally hear what you're saying. I would also like to go on record that I too do not have wild nights out. I don't know what I would do. I'm like an <laughs> in-bed by person. But um, I do think of that and I am conscientious because there is that fine line between trying to help solve a problem and becoming part of the problem, right? And corporate workplace toxicity, I feel like there are two really strong schools of thought right now. There is, it's work, get over it. And yeah. that excuses a lot of really bad behaviors. And then there's the no more toxicity ever and everything should work 
really well. And I think that's really hard for companies to achieve and like in a perfection. Um, and something I talk a lot about with clients is like, uh, I'm a firm believer that each company has a ghost culture and that's like what the yeah. CEO thinks it is and what they put on the placard. And then every company has a subculture, which is what the manager makes their team feel. And until you get all of your subcultures aligned in a good way and healthy and avoiding toxic practices, you're going to continue to have issues. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts since you're so involved in like the toxicity part of work, the mental health, like within those two schools of thought, how do you see things trending? What changes do you see happening in the workplace? I know we've touched a little bit on like Gen Z and Gen Alpha, but how are things getting better? We hope for like the corporate employee. Yeah, You said something really interesting that kind of triggered something in my head that I've never actually spoken about because I don't think I was allowed to, uh, but fuck them. Uh, when I <laughs> left, <laughs> when I left my in-house role, um, because it, they basically, it, it was a very, like, I was unhappy fundamentally and it was really impacting my mm -hmm. mental health. So I just decided to leave, um, because I was trying to do social media. I was trying to do that job and sort of my boss was a very extreme micromanaging boss that, uh, that made life very difficult there for me. So I opted to leave um, and handed in my notice. And the very last email I got from that organization, the line ended with, it was about my social media and it said, I still have the email. I also like filmed a video at that moment back in 20, end of 22, beginning of 23, but never posted it. Um, I just had to do it to get it out my system. Uh, but the line said that you advocate for sort of, so like, mental well-being and uh, workplace well-being, but don't let your online social media persona be part of the problem. And that's something that really stuck with me because I always thought up until that moment that I was talking openly around sort of toxic corporate behaviors, uh, talking about my own sort of experiences and that's something that I'd never thought that I was doing or wouldn't ever do around that. So just on that point about not being part of the problem, I think people like us, creators like us are shining a light on problems that already exist. And mm -hmm. by calling them out and challenging them, we're almost changing the narrative that those behaviors that have been normalized in a lot of organizations aren't actually acceptable. They're not normal behaviors. It's not normal to be crying in work because of work. It's not normal to be throwing up through anxiety because you're worried about the work that you have to do. And through people like us openly sharing our experiences, it's going to make other people feel more comfortable and confident to speak up and talk about their experiences or challenge things within their organizations or speak up to sort of leaders um, and they're like, and I'm not saying everyone needs to just go and quit their job if they're unhappy, um, <laughs> because that would be ignorant to the fact that people can't just quit their jobs. Um, but I think if nothing else, if we can encourage people to speak up and challenge um, things that don't sit right with them. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing in organizations, particularly with Gen Z. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of that. And I think we're going to start seeing more organizational leaders listen and start implementing changes that benefit um sort of the well-being around sort of millennials gen z's um and more sort of employers more broadly it's so great what you're sharing henry about like almost this concept of like building that psychological safety right to speak up to identify yeah. those like workplace issues and i think it's great because you may empathize. When I first joined the workforce, you just didn't do that. And I remember I have a really horrible story, but I've shared it on a few episodes. I'll leave that out for everybody's <laughs> sanity. But um, I had a, a boss once who micromanagement constantly gave negative feedback, never empowered me to do anything. I remember the last day that I worked there, I lost my patience. And I basically was like, what do you want me to do? I have tried to do it your way. I've tried to do it my way. Neither way seems to work. Do you have something you need that you'd like to communicate? And I remember he told me, he said, I have pushed you as hard as I possibly could for over a year. And it took you that long to stand up to me. And I remember thinking in my head, like, what a horrible management practice yep. to push until your employee breaks 
yeah. to build open communication and trust. Like that's a horrible way to build that. And so um, I definitely see like the tides are changing. My CIO now has uh, been very supportive of like, hey, we want to build better employee engagement practices. He's really empowered me to build good things for our teams. And it, I see that shift happening slowly but surely. But to end on a, a light note and a positive note, I'd love to hear what are some of your favorite uh, toxic workplace issues that you've made videos about? Um, from like a more humorous perspective of like the things that that bother the millennials in the workplace? I think the worst one, and it will always be, as you mentioned, the micromanaging boss. Um, <laughs> they exist everywhere. And I just the think, worst. where are they coming from? Who is allowing this um, to happen? I also hate, this is just the millennial in me and the anxiety that we have unplanned calls. Um, I was just going to say the team's call. Yeah, Don't the unplanned me. team's call, or the, have you got a sec? I'm like, for what? <laughs> <laughs> for what? Tell me. What exactly? Uh, because I will, I'll then join that call. All I'll do is like niceties, and I'll talk about anything but work to kind of like swipe, side swipe them so they don't like say, actually, you're really rubbish at your job, which has never happened. It's just the millennial in me panic. In your head. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I don't like that. Or being in the office for the collaboration and the collaboration is we're all sat on the same zoom call all at our desks <laughs> with headphones on on mute because we didn't even go to a meeting room to do this collectively <laughs> so why am i here i love that no it's so funny the the last one i worked for a team uh in bournemouth in the uk and oh, yeah, yeah. i alone in a building on zoom calls with everybody in the other office like what am i doing here what is my purpose I'm just driving into the office to sit on Zoom all day. Um, no, I love it. These these are great ones. Um, I love to give you an opportunity. If somebody's listening to this and what you've said has really resonated with them, what's like one piece of advice you would give of like, hey, tomorrow when you walk into your corporate job, here's what I would like you to do to kind of like pr protect your mental health, help fight toxicity. Where would you kind of guide them to, to really start making an impact? I think one thing that has really stuck with me and something that I'm trying to implement more and I think having a social media presence has kind of given me more of a level of confidence to do this um, because I don't interesting I don't know if you're the same but in real life not on the internet I'm not that confident like I'm very anxious and very shy and I get nervous very easily but I think my one top tip to anybody would be kind of don't change yourself to fit in with the standards of that organization because you're not a clone you're not like those other people you are unique um and as soon as you start changing yourself to fit in you're going to lose yourself and then sort of sort of the mental load the burnout the stress that you're carrying is just going to be heightened um and the time it comes to leaving that organization you're going to have lost your entire identity um so don't change yourself to fit in would be my key key thing and i think that applies just generally as well yes. outside of corporate I agree. Yeah. I think finding your authentic self. That, yeah. <laughs> that. Yeah. We're I think you summarized what I just said in like four words. That's what I needed to say. Yeah. <laughs> you did this corporate in me versus the lawyer in you. You're like, yeah, I got yeah, it. Yeah. Here's a load of wood. Yes. <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, Henry, this is such a fun chat. If people yeah, want to watch your content, get more connected with you, where can they go to find you? Yeah, sure. So you can find me on TikTok and Instagram at that corporate lawyer. Awesome. And we'll be tagging you and everything in the show notes as well. But if you guys like today's episode and your chat with Henry was fun and you want more amazing guests like him, make sure you give us five stars, leave your review below. Otherwise, thank you so much, Henry. We'll have to have you back soon. Awesome. See you later. Bye, everyone.